Good evening, Papua New Guinea, and welcome to a new episode of Business PNG. Tonight, we bring you another edition of Business Advantage Boardroom. Publishing Director of Business Advantage International, Andrew Wilkins, has a chat this time with some of the stakeholders of the country's manufacturing sector. Good evening. I'm Andrew Wilkins from Business Advantage International. Welcome to Business Advantage Boardroom, a quarterly program that discusses the issues facing business in PNG. In the boardroom today, we're discussing the challenges and opportunities for manufacturing in PNG. Now, when you go to the supermarket, you may see soft drinks, snacks, and canned foods with the PNG made label on them. But these are just a small number of the enormous amounts of goods that are made in PNG. The sheer variety might surprise you building materials, paints, packaging, refined petroleum, furniture, clothing, prefabricated houses, water tanks, detergents, chocolate canned fish, beer, beauty products, mechanical components, and much, much more. Now, there's a lot of talk about the need to create new jobs in PNG, and manufacturing employs a lot of people. Manufacturers are also involved in making products that reduce PNG's reliance on imports, and they often, too, add extra value to basic commodities like cocoa or tuna, which are then exported around the world. But making things in PNG isn't always easy for all sorts of reasons that we'll explore today. Now, to discuss manufacturing, I'm joined by Shay Scavell, the Chief Executive Officer of the Manufacturers' Council of PNG, the peak body which represents PNG's manufacturers and also runs the PNG Made campaign. Welcome, Shay. And also Ernestine Maxton Graham of small manufacturer Maxton House, which makes beauty products from PNG coconut oil. Welcome. And finally, Frank McCoy, Chairman of Steel Industries, which makes fabricated steel for building and construction. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Now, let's start with the value that manufacturing adds into the PNG economy. And maybe we'll start, Frank, with you. Um, fabricated steel, if it wasn't made in PNG, it'd have to be imported. Is that pretty much the way it is? Yes, and a great deal of uh, steel, a majority of our steel, is imported into Papua New Guinea. The important thing to realize, even though we are using imported basic raw materials, that imported component is roughly 25% of the final value of fabricated steel that goes to the contractor. Yeah. Thus, 75% of the value of our product is PNG made with PNG inputs in terms of labor, in terms of overheads, in terms of other products that are manufactured in PNG, mm -hmm. such as the paint that we put onto our steel product. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long has steel industry has been going in, in PNG and how many people does it employ? Well, I'm glad you asked because <laughs> we just passed a few days ago 50 years. Wow. We were formed on 27 January. 1967. We had at the height in the early 2000s 292 employees. Mm -hmm. Today we're at 197 employees. Still a good size medium company. Some may even refer to it as being a large company. It depends on your perspective, I guess. Absolutely. By international standards, we would be a small company. Mm -hmm. By PNG standards, I think we are a large company if we can provide 200 jobs. And of mm -hmm. course, we have the opportunity to provide more jobs within the facility that we have. For the last 12 years, we've been operating uh, two shifts where we have a night shift that operates for 12 hours. Uh, with an hour and a half off, ten and a half hours of work, mm. four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. And then, of course, we run our regular shift Monday to Friday. And when times are rolling and times are good, which is currently the case, I'm yep. pleased to say, we're operating on Saturday as well. And how is, how is your product used in the marketplace? Like what sort of, um, it's mostly construction, is that right? Uh, I'd say a majority in construction, but we do a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the entire automotive industry with our trucks are not able to import from Japan or China a hundred different types of uh, uses for their trucks, for their prime movers. Mm -hmm. They come to steel industries and other people in the industry mm -hmm. to produce what goes behind the truck. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Now, I might just ask you now, Ernestine. Now, you're, you're a relatively small business. How many employees would, would uh, Maxton House have? We have about 10 employees, 10 to 15. When we're full on production, we, we do 15. We do two, two, um, two produ um, production lines, and one's the um, body oil moisturiser and the mm -hmm. coconut soap, and um, both coconut products, obviously. And also we started on the coconut cooking oil as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we, d we produce about 1,000 litres of oil a, um, a day. A day? A day. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and where are you sourcing your coconut oil from? At the moment, down um, Abao, down the central, um, mm -hmm. down towards Cupiano Way, that's where most of our coconuts are coming from. And I guess um, the key thing about your business is you're taking a raw material which is readily available and produced in PNG anyway, and you're also adding significant value, as the Steel Industries is also adding value to its products. Um, what's the difference between, say, the, the, the cost of coconut oil and then by the time you've turned it into soap or body oil, What's the difference in the value that you've added to that product? Oh, a good 70%, yeah. actually. Um, but, you know, it's, we, we value add, but also the farmers ha have also, the village farmers, they've got that opportunity to also use the coconut in, in different ways as well. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to us, we've, we've value added to the product for our product itself, but the, um, the farmers have the choice to also change that coconut to other because there's so many uses for, for coconut oil out there and coconut products. Mm. Um, and the way that the, that the world has um, taken um, coconut, um, just the, the uses of it, is the interest as a trend, um, it's, the, it's, it's allowed the, the village farmers to also you know, think about, they don't just have to provide for me, there are other um, uses of the coconut. Mm. And how's the, how long has the business been going? What, what made oh, you so start? We're, we're into our second year at the moment, mm -hmm. going on to our third year. And um, we first started off in Canudi, um, out in, out in, um, uh, heading out towards the LNG plant out that way. Mm -hmm. And now we're based out at Six Mile. So we got our machineries from uh, USA uh, for the soap and um, China. Um, <coughs> and the raw materials, obviously, from here. But... Most of my product, uh, the ingredients, I try to source everything from here. Yeah. So, for example, if, if um, making vanilla, I try to use the vanilla products from here, um, which then also leads to one of my um, challenges in the consistency of, of the supply. Of course. Um, so other of those ingredients then gets um, imported. Excellent. Shay, have we got any statistics or any information <laughs> that sort of demonstrates what contribution manufacturing makes to P&G's economy? It's hard to look at the hard data and I think one of the things I'd say is that often when we look at the contribution to GDP, mm. it's just straight manufacturing and not value-added industry. So certainly, um, you know, Newcrest, uh, New Britain Palm Oil, they consider themselves manufacturers and are members of the Manufacturers Council. Uh, New Britain Palm Oil don't export fruit bunches mm. and, uh, and likewise none of the people in the extractive industries are exporting solid chunks of rock. It's, you know, highly refined it's, before yeah, it leaves. Processed. But they are not included in the numbers for P&G there. So I think if we take them out, we're looking at about 35 to 4% GDP mm -hmm. of manufactured goods. In terms of total employment, we're still very significant, employing roughly 40 to 50% of the formal workforce in Papua New Guinea, wow. which is, uh, uh, we've sort of always rivaled and sat about parallel with the public service size, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the largest employer, formal employer, I, I should say. And then in terms of value, that's a very hard one to sort of mm -hmm. ascertain because uh, if you look at things like the Tebbit research, they'll talk about the number of... Uh, SMEs in value-added areas, which is a little bit outside of traditional, is about 20, 21 billion kina per annum. And then if you have a look at the figures for those sort of headline manufacturers, mm. it's just a little bit more than that again. So that's the size. I think in the government plans, in terms of manufacturing, they had hoped to see it around 30% of GDP. Uh, whilst the GDP hasn't doubled per se, I mm. think that if we go back to the last time the plans were revised in 2005, the economy is certainly much bigger. Mm -hmm. So it's relative. Manufacturing has held 3%. It means it's almost doubled in terms of our output and our yes. participation in the economy. Yeah. And what are your members saying about market conditions right now? Listen, they're, in the long term, they're optimistic. We, of course, the foreign exchange is causing some issues in terms of being able to source the inputs. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, in terms of policy, so... 
on the two products here. Uh, we've had discussions with all of the people in the PNG industry for providing prefabricated housing. Right now, the PNG companies providing manufactured uh, houses, be it either out of timber or steel, uh, uh, are producing about 800 to 1,200 homes a month. Uh, the government has plans to roll out several, you know, 100,000 in the first year, getting up to three, 400,000 per annum. Uh, if at the moment they look at local industry and say, oh, we need to import all of that from overseas because mm. the local industry can't meet the demand. However, if there was a commitment from the government that they were going to use local companies, mm. we know that within about 12 to 18 months, PNG companies, as well as new entrants that we don't know about who, who would come in, could increase their output to about eight to 10,000 houses per month. So there's really strong positive vibes there, mm. but it relies entirely on the government not awarding a contract to two or three importers mm. to import 98% of the houses that will be affordable homes, and then the, uh, you won't have an industry for PNG. And, the, and likewise for spa and beauty products, the foreign exchange crunch has been a a real boost to that. We've all known from stores around the country, Andrew, have mm -hmm. you, you've seen spaces on the shelves. Yep. It's not because people don't have money to go and buy, it's because the supermarkets can't get the foreign exchange to buy the goods and they've really turned to local manufacturers. So Ernestine's one of a couple of manufacturers that have really jumped up into that space. But the positive news there is that all of them are looking heavily at the export market. Yep. Again, it comes to you know other policies and sides in terms of their supply. Uh, unlike some manufacturers like Frank maybe having issues getting in, you know, sufficient steel, uh, the challenges for people like Ernestine is getting our farmers to provide enough coconuts yes. on a consistent basis. You know, if you've got an order for one or two containers a month for an export market and one week you've got, you know, uh, 1,500 coconuts a day coming in and then the next week it drops down to 400 because everybody's putting the kids in school, it really affects the production issues there. So. There are challenges right now, but in the long haul, people still see that the, uh, you know, the market's big enough to grow. Yeah. Frank, you mentioned that you're quite happy with the way the market is at the moment. I imagine with something like uh, steel, though, it has, it has ups and downs. How do you see the market looking forward for, for your product and how much is um, your business is influenced by the state of the economy? Well, very much with the state of the economy, mm. uh, we currently are, the metal trades industry has approximately 20% of the domestic market with about 80% being imported. So if we can get a bigger chunk of the market, mm. there's an opportunity without any growth whatsoever to be five times as large as we are today. Five times as large? Well, because we have about 20% of the national yeah. market being produced domestically. Okay. So now we know that that is not going to happen, but certainly a growth of 15 or 20% is well within the scope, within mm. the demand that we currently have. Uh, Shea has mentioned uh, housing. You can look around at 8 Mile, uh, you're at the airport and you look out and you see a whole new city yeah. out there, 5,000 new houses. Uh, I'd hate to tell you how many are produced nationally and how many came in and kept form from China. Mm. Uh, but these are the issues that have to be uh, looked, uh, uh, looked at. And there's really only two issues that I would like to bring up. One is the duty-free importations. Parliament has decided that we're to have a 10% protective tariff. Very, very small by mm -hmm. international standards. But the vast majority all come in duty-free. Any project that wants is large enough and wants duty-free protection goes to the NEC. They believe it's in the national interest to lower our costs and income imported uh, goods. That's being modified slightly just due to the lack of foreign exchange. Mm. And the two of us share an experience of increased demand just because we have clients yes. that don't want to go through the hassle yes. of getting the foreign exchange. And they know when they come to our companies, they can pay for their product in PNG Kina. Yeah. Okay. And that's an important selling point for, for Absolutely. your... Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
And would you back that up, Ernestine? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the things I've noticed already just on uh, international products on that that is my that are my competition from mm -hmm. Fiji. That's you hardly see them on the shelf now throughout Papua New Guinea, okay. which that, is great. And that's something that's changed quite recently as a result of, of the exchange. Yeah, you look at the biscuit market. Uh, yeah. A lot of the FMC food manufactured products. Uh, all of the local manufacturers have really been going gangbusters and small goods manufacturers as well. Um, Savloy's had a big kick, not so much just for the foreign exchange, but 18 months ago, uh, lamb flaps mm. prices ex New Zealand was uh, only a couple of dollars and it's had a fourfold increase in price. So the, the affordability there really kicked it on. And it's all been good. Mm. So just people that make Savloy's in Papua New Guinea in the last 12 months, we've got five new manufacturers they're all indigenous owned manufacturers located throughout the highlands, something we've never really had before. People taking, you know, manufacturing and value added industries of a, of a, of a significant scale into the heartland where the people are. So that's, mm. that's really, really positive. But we hope that it continues on the other side. I think one thing that Frank didn't touch on is, is that we are competitive in pricing and the standards. Right. So uh, yeah. we've yeah. done the numbers, particularly on prefabricated housing and building materials. And it doesn't matter if you're getting a steel fabricated house out of Steel Industries or Atlas or, you know, the timber from uh, PNG Forestry Products or Quick Built. They are as affordable, in some cases more affordable, but they're all built to the standards. You know, we even have issues with bridges coming into the country mm. under the guise of meeting Australian standards. The PNG standard has equivalents, but they don't meet the standard. And this is where we see all of these failures. We can get them fabricated here locally mm. more affordably than what you would pay for something that meets the standard. So yeah, that's a challenge there also. Yes. But we have the capacity in the industry, and you mentioned growing employment. It would be how do you get a, a vibrant building industry mm. if you allow people to import everything for free, ready made, and they also bring in the labour to assemble it? So. Mm. At best, we might get a couple of foremen or people to clean up around the sides. Yes. Whereas you go and have a look, you know, you've got 194 people in steel industries, PNG Forestry Products, Atlas, Quigville. They've all got a, you know, a few hundred employees apiece. If they were getting these big orders, and even Red Sea even bigger again, but they would employ more people. And then you have the the people that go out there and paint the houses, the people that put in the plumbing, put in the electrics, all of these things. Whereas the sandwich kit houses that are coming in. Everything's done, so we don't need an electrician, we don't need the plumbing, we don't need somebody to paint. It really cuts out lots and lots of jobs. So, Well, let's talk a little bit more about constraints or some of the challenges of operating, because it's not always easy. Uh, maybe start with you, Ernestine. What sort of challenges did you face getting your business off the ground? Oh, wow. <laughs> there's, a, there's a long <laughs> list of this. Um, I'll try to keep it short and simple. But I think, you know, just to start off with, it's, not, it, it's, just, it's more so getting your equipment Mm -hmm. um, arriving here and, and finding the, the personnel to, to get your infrastructure up and running for you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the hardest thing. Um, I learned getting something from China, everything was in Chinese. I'm pretty lucky I do speak Chinese, but still, that is you very know, useful. but I'm not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't do that, you know, mm. so just and we use a lot of steel industries too. Good, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, and you do, you do have to, the challenge is, is learning to adapt um, very quickly. You, you wear a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. you know, um, the, staff, my, the staff, none of my staff, most of making coconut oil, they do it on the islands, they don't do it on the mainland. Right. So I had to teach them all how to make soap, how to make the oil, understand the coconut. So, you know, but they're, they've come across as a welder who, now they're crushing coconuts as well as welding, as well as, you know, they, they wear a lot of hats. That's, and that's what you have to do um, as a small business. Mm -hmm. um, your staff can get employed to this, but they will have to do um, quite a few jobs. And I tell them straight out that, you know, this is what you'll be doing. Um, but everyone's happy to do it because the greatest thing is that, um, that they've got a finished product and it's something that they did and they see it on the shelf and it comes mm -hmm. from their country. That's, that's one of the um, achievements that they feel that they've um, accomplished. Um, but apart from, apart from that, it's, it's as, as Shay mentioned, sourcing um, uh, supply, having mm. consistent supply, that, it, that is definitely a struggle. Um, and also getting your other, um, you know, 
banks or other institutions to also fall into play with you, understand where you're going and help, help you along. This, this, there seems to be, um, I don't know what it is, lack of education or bureaucracy or no one follows up on, on what you're trying to do. So you're, that you, a lot of your work is just that you're always chasing the same thing for the whole day. It's, it's crazy. Just to ask you on a personal level, what satisfaction you get out of being a manufacturer in Papua New Guinea? We'll start maybe with you first, Ernestine. Um, for me, it's being a Papua New Guinean that can actually produce something that I see on the shelf that they all do like to use. Mm. And everyone in the world is talking about it. And the, it's the industry that is, um, the, the coconut industry itself is looking at ensuring that the, that the products, that the coconut products that come out of Papua New Guinea um, does meet uh, um, the quality standards mm -hmm. and that for me is very important and that I'm very proud so if someone picks up a coconut oil from Papua New Guinea I know you're going to get a good coconut oil. It mm -hmm. is coconut oil. And that's the most important thing that it's not being, you know, people aren't buying it because it's from Papua New Guinea, they're buying it because it's good. Yes, but knowing that it is from Papua New Guinea. Yeah. You know, when that's I look it. to Europe, people from Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. from Moldova, from France, you know, countries that either have very high discerning tastes, Sri Lanka, a big exporter, said this is a real premium product. Yep. Now, what they would like, and it is organic, but we don't have the facilities yes. in PNG in an affordable manner for the certification of those sorts of things. But we really are, you know, Ernestine, yeah. the few other operators mm -hmm. in that space, are making products that the rest of the world is saying this is, you know, the Maserati of this range and it's done here locally. Yeah. It's fantastic. Frank, your, your own personal satisfaction for being a manufacturer. Every day I go to the shop floor, mm -hmm. I'm proud of yes. what we can do. And of course it's not me, it's our Papua New Guinean workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do it. Mm -hmm. We have done it. We are doing it. And we are making a competitive product to international standards and we're doing it with Papua New Guineans. I'm proud of being able to achieve that in my lifetime. That's fantastic. Well, it's an excellent place to leave it. Um, thank you again, my guests, Frank McCoy, Ernestine Maxton Graham, and Shay Scavell. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you. And that's all for Business Advantage, sorry, I'll say it again. And that's all for Business Advantage Boardroom this time. Goodbye. And that's all from us tonight. For more business news, or if you would like to view this episode again, visit MTV online at the URL at the bottom of the screen, or for up to the minute business news and updates, like our page on Facebook, or follow us on the Twitter handle at BusinessPNG. Until next week, have a pleasant evening. I'm Michelle Bird, and this was Business PNG.